Hey everybody, Liam here. Uh, we have a pretty darn fun, good show for you today, but between the time that we recorded our show and uh, when I was finishing up the edit for it, we got some bad news, which was that WWE released even more talent late Thursday night. Um, so I wanted to just touch on that briefly here um, before we get to the main show, where we'll talk about AEW's Full Gear show and Dynamite and Survivor Series and all that fun stuff. But uh, before we get to that, let's just very quickly go down the list of names. This is per Sean Ross Sapp on Twitter. Fightful has learned that WWE have released John Morrison, Top Dalla, Ashanti Adonis, Isaiah Swerve Scott, Tegan Knox, Drake Maverick, Shane Thorne, and Jackson Riker. Um, obviously, none of those names have been used too much on TV um, and didn't seem like a good sign when, uh, when B-Fab was cut last week for the rest of the Hit Row crew, but still somewhat of a surprise. It had seemed that we had wrapped up on these WWE releases, at least for 2021, but we uh, we got a few more released here, and uh, Sean Ross Sapp did also mention that the reason that was given by John Laurinaitis in these uh, talent release emails was, of course, the dreaded budget cuts. Uh, really hope WWE gets that budget under control one of these days so they can stop cutting people to uh, to make ends meet. But yeah, it's frustrating. It's sad. They're the most profitable they've ever been. They don't have to do this, but they do because that is the unmoving, unchanging, terrible, broken wheel of capitalism. All right, at that point, I'm going to get off my soapbox and let you enjoy the rest of a pretty fun show uh, where we'll talk about Hangman's title win, Charlotte versus Becky, and all that fun stuff, uh, a little bit of lighter stuff, uh, as well as thoughts on the Jay Lethal thing and many, many other topics. So stay tuned for our regular show. Thanks, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, salt and pepper! The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 283. It is the week before Thanksgiving 2021. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. That's right, and so much that we cannot talk about right here on the first and only Wrestling Podcast. You know, that stuff that we can't talk about, we talked about before we got on the air, and it's just, it's going to be cut, and sorry, you guys can't hear it. Yeah, but, it's, um, the, it's the I'll tell you off the air of, uh, of the show. <laughs> That's right. Unfortunately, the show before the show might be better than the show itself, <laughs> but anyway, big week in wrestling. There was an AEW pay-per-view. It feels like it was five weeks ago, but it was uh, this past weekend. There's a WWE pay-per-view this coming weekend. Uh, let's start with last weekend, AEW Full Gear. Strong pay-per-view, not as strong as the one before. Uh, big picture thoughts. What did you think of uh, Full Gear? Yeah, it's funny because I think you could argue like from a quantity standpoint, there were more good matches on this show than the last one, maybe. But I did not enjoy it nearly as much. Um, there wasn't a ton that I thought was bad per se. I didn't really enjoy the uh, Jericho thing, um, but I mean, that's, that's an evergreen <laughs> statement, um, but, <laughs> but uh, no, like I thought that was, but again, crowds love it. So and, it's just, and it was like a, it was like a buffer. Too. Yeah, it was fine. It, it didn't go 15 minutes too long. Like I feel most Chris Jericho pay-per-view matches have gone in the last uh, two years or so. Um, but yeah, overall, it was it was a solid show. And as we kind of talked about on our last show, I think people were buying it for the main event to see Hangman win the world title. And you got that and no no chicanery involved. No, I guess we had we had some we had some lore. We had some young bucks Hangman <laughs> page uh, staring longingly at each other. But uh, but be, other than that, it was just clean as a sheet. Hangman. Hangman did not kick out of the one winged angel. Kenny did, but Hangman didn't. And mm -hmm. then, uh, and then Hangman hit a buckshot route lariat to the back, buckshot lariat to the front, won the belt. Hey, good stuff. Really fun. Really glad he got that moment. 
And uh, I am, as has been discussed uh, probably several times on this show over the years, I am a real sucker for Babyface wins the world title and then all his friends come out and put him on, on their shoulders. So <laughs> always a fan of that as an ending to a pay-per-view. I mean, you just never see it in the other major wrestling company. So, I mean, we've seen it like once since 1994. <laughs> yeah, right. It's what, what Sammy and NXT is that? I'm trying to think if there's been another time they've done it, but I can't think of one. Yeah, I can't think of any at all. Uh, besides Brett at WrestleMania 10. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, but yeah, good times. And then they set up uh, Hangman and uh, Brian Danielson on Dynamite with Danielson. I don't like the Shades of Grey thing, but mm-hmm. Danielson clearly playing more heelish and the fans willing to buy into that, at least for this scenario, uh, should be fun. Yeah, I, I was, I guess, surprised how far he went to the to like the line of of, of heelish in that uh, it's not like a cartoony WWE heel where he yells about being a vegan or whatever, but like <laughs> it was like he made a point. He mentioned WrestleMania and how he wrestled the night the night after he won the title at WrestleMania, and that of course got huge boos from the AEW crowd, and then. Like when the crowd booed him, he goes, oh, well, of course, these people here in Virginia would boo hard work. I was like, wow, that was that was funny. That was I mean, it's great. Like, I really enjoyed that (laughs) segment and it made me want to see them wrestle. So, I mean, mission accomplished. But I guess I was just surprised how hard they went with it that quickly. Like we didn't have like a gradual thing where, you know, they shake hands and it's tense for a few weeks and then. We get to, you know, and then Brian sort of progressively gets more, uh, you know, more heel like as it goes. They kind of just went zero to 60 on it. But it was, yeah, it was all all in the same segment. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's probably the critique of it is that it kind of came a little bit out of nowhere from uh, from Jolly. But I, I guess to be fair, Brian Danielson and like every uh, I'm never quite sure if those post show scrums are supposed to be in character or not. Ugh. But uh, Brian Danielson, I think in the first one and then in the one again this week, said something to the effect of I'm not I unlike CM Punk, I am not here to help any anybody else. I am here to beat them up and and win win the world title. So I guess you can say there's been little seeds in that in that stuff. But on television, he's just been like a nice smiling guy who, you know, beats up beats up wrestlers that he's wrestling, but doesn't seem to have any animosity against on like a personal level and here they just went, they just went zero to 60 real quick, but it was a good segment. So, you know, that's a, that's the sandwich compliment. I think of, uh, of hangman's hangman's title celebration and his, his first challenger. So it was a down night for the elite at full gear. Uh, the bucks and, and, and Adam Cole lost Omega loses. Omega is probably taking time off to get shoulder surgery. So it kind of clears the deck. And then, Dynamite was uh, a much differently paced show than usual, I thought, in a good way. It was kind of it was kind of uh, slow and all about setting up where they're going next. And they're going with MJF and CM Punk next, which should be good promos. And the match will be probably secondary. But by the way, CM Punk and Eddie Kingston. Those guys killed it at the paper oh, mail. That was great. I'm trying to think. And they did not go very long. It was like right around 10 minutes, right? Uh, I didn't time it, but it did. Def- it felt like it didn't go long. Yes. So, like, I'm trying to think of like how many matches that went that relatively short and were that intense and that physical and like that I can remember enjoying that much. Like it's probably a short list, but yeah, they they beat each other up real good. And I thought it was like by leaps and bounds, it was the best CM Punk has looked um, in in his time in AEW, and and I think that's part of it too. Is like it was it was something to sink their teeth into. I think I don't think we talked about their promo exchange they had done on on the one show, but it just felt like we've seen a lot of CM Punk happy to be there, like you know, kindly Uncle Punk since he's <laughs> been back, and so to see him like have something where it's just like where he was just like the, the wide eyed, like angry CM Punk. It was like, Oh yeah, there's that guy. Like there's the guy that, 
that uh that I remember <laughs> being a big fan of. So it was kind of cool. Like not that I haven't enjoyed like his his victory lap and his you know glad handing and everything, but then you see the the mean guy, the mean CM Punk, the man Brian Danielson once referred to as <laughs> the meanest person I've ever met. Um uh who at his core is an asshole. Um, I think is it was kind of it was kind of cool to see CM Punk in that light for even if it was just for this for this uh, Eddie feud. So I'll be interested to see where they go with this with where now he is in a more classic baby face heel dynamic. I have known Jay Leno for over 30 years. This is what I like (laughs) to say is vintage Jay. (laughs) And I like seeing that. I like seeing like, ah, there's the guy I know. (laughs) Yes. Sometimes I, I just like to trickle little Dave Letterman uh, verbal Easter eggs for, for you to pick up on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Punk kind of walked right up to that line of, uh, of playing heel for the, uh, for the Kingston thing too. So that's interesting. I Sean don't... Spears, by the way, <laughs> one, of, one of the most useless pieces of talent in AEW, but First of all, his, his outfit on Dynamite this week, he wore a suit with no shirt <laughs> and a uh, a toque hat. Yes. And then, then sat down and ate a protein bar <laughs> <laughs> in the background while MJF was cutting a promo. Uh, it was an attempt at being funny, and I thought it was funny. Yeah. So I, tr- trust me, I hate putting over Sean Spears, <laughs> but uh, I thought that was funny. For a myriad of reasons, I hate putting him over. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought that was a uh, that was, and I guess if nothing else, eventually Wardlow is going to snap and just murder Sean Spears, and that'll be fun. Yeah, definitely would. And then, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, Cassie Lee will be a widow. So that would be terrible. That would be a horrible thing to have happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Britt Baker. Be Tecanti to keep the AEW Women's World title at pay-per-view. I think Britt Baker is going to be champion for a decade. <laughs> I think that's my not to step on our next show where we predict he's going to hold the titles a year from now. Mm-hmm. But I think Britt Baker is going to be champ for approximately a decade. But uh, Ty Conti, eh, it was, eh, <laughs> you know, I think it was. <laughs> one of Britt Baker's better matches since she's been champion, which I have not necessarily think she's had like a stellar in ring run since she's been the champion, but I know she was also working on an injury and they had like a weird heel heel dynamic with her and Nyla. So that might not be all her fault, but I think she is someone that is kind of dependent upon who she's working with. And um, so I thought it was, you know, it was a lot of pump kicks and, and and stuff and interference from from Reba and and Jamie Hader cowboy emoji and and yeah it was it was it was all right but uh, I was thinking about that as the pre-show match which was Sheeta and Thunder Rosa against Nyla and Jamie Hader and I was like well all of these people are in the TBS tournament for the time being like who does Brit have to wrestle other than I guess the losers of the tournament. <laughs> Like everyone that loses can come challenge her for the for the other belt, but it, it just doesn't seem like there's a uh, like a big a big marquee match. I guess eventually it's her and Rosa, right? That's what we're building to. Well, but we're not yeah, building but... to it. <laughs> Theoretically, right. they should be, but they haven't really. Other than like an occasional mention, we don't really. It doesn't feel like we're we're getting back on that track yet. The the announcers somehow managed to work in every week that uh, Thunder Rose's win over Britt Baker did not count in the win loss record. So they definitely, that's definitely the direction, but to your point, they've been, you know, that match was eight months ago, first of all, and we haven't gotten back to it yet, Mm -hmm. which, which is fine, you know, whatever. But to your, I think your stronger point there is, yeah, Thunder Rose is going to lose in the TBS Championship Tournament, and then fresh off a loss, she'll be going after the the world title. <laughs> so, okay, 
Yeah, I guess that's 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 the part that doesn't make sense to me. It's like, well, it's like all of the women that you could see challenging her. It's like, okay, you could do a rematch with Sheeta. Okay, she just lost this week and is probably going to, I guess, going to feud with Deeb a little bit more. But on the babyface IBS Statlander, who she's already beaten and I assume will lose in the, in the tournament. Um, and then whoever the, cha- the TBS champion is, if that's a babyface, you have to assume that they won't be challenging for the world title if they're the, the TBS champion. So it's like, all right, I don't know. I don't know who we got left. Yep. So um, good pay-per-view, better a dynamite that I enjoyed more than usual. I still am not the world's biggest AEW fan, but uh, I have I have a lot fewer bad things to say about them this week than I normally do, except that per, that post show media scrum after full gear. First of all, they brought in the extremely problematic Jay Lethal mm-hmm. <laughs> from Ring of Honor. And first of all, I'd like to. Um, Uh, rip all of the media that were in that room that not one single quote-unquote journalist or quote-unquote reporter asked Tony Khan or Jay Lethal who both had had live microphones in front of them about the results of the investigate the internal investigation that Sinclair Broadcasting reportedly uh, conducted against Lethal who faced two separate uh, charges of sexual misconduct not one single journalist in the room had the guts to ask either lethal or Tony Khan about it. So at that point, you're not journalists, you're fans and that's fine. Like I'm a Mark. I get my photo taken with wrestlers. Like I wouldn't say I'm a journalist, but also I'm not in the room at a press conference with, with the people and no one else is going to hold those people's feet to the fire. So uh, disappointed in uh, Wade Keller, and I saw Sean Ross Sapp saying that because he's friends and co-workers with one of the people that accused Lethal, that he was going to respect his friend's wishes and not discuss it. I guess I understand that, but uh, also then at that point, you are not a journalist either. So uh, anyway... Also, that post-show media scrum, I had to watch the whole thing, and there was absolutely nothing newsworthy to come out of it. <laughs> it was just, it was like the old UFC press press conferences where reporters would kiss up to Dana White and ask him, hey, when are you coming to my town? And Dana would answer, well, you know, we'll be there soon. That was basically the, the pro-show presser uh, with Tony Khan. Really disgusting. Tony Khan ended up somehow for some reason shooting up people who got who criticized his dad <laughs> for for buying the four seasons in Toronto <laughs> from a Saudi national. And, you know, very relatable problem to have, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, who who among us hasn't had their father buy the four seat buy a four seasons hotel and get unfairly criticized for it. But uh, just a bizarre post-show press conference and uh they may be the lesser of two evils but uh they're uh still not a huge fan of the people that run AEW and still no one has satisfactory satisfactorily answered a lot of the questions that people seem to have about Jay White and or Jay, Jay Lethal I'm sorry Jay Lethal mm-hmm. very important distinction Jay Lethal AEW bringing in Jay Lethal. Uh, do you have any thoughts on um, how many people are uh, going to get second chances in this business? Uh, <laughs> AEW bringing in Jay Lethal, these sorts of things. Well, I'll just say this. Uh, recently, uh, I believe his name is Travis Banks. Um, yes. Was working a show for uh, Bandito's promotion. Yes. And when people noticed it, he was pulled from the show. And then a (laughs) mysterious masked wrestler appeared on the show that turned out to be Travis Banks in a mask. 
Yes. This is, this is, and again, this is not the only area of the entertainment industry that is like this. Mel Gibson is still making movies like high yes. budget, major motion pictures. He's in family comedies with Will Ferrell. He is allegedly directing an, a lethal weapon revival. Like, right. which is, we have talked about this before the cancel culture as a, as a quote unquote problem facing this country or the entertainment industry or politics or whatever largely does not exist in the way that people talk about it. And people are going to look out for their friends and whether they justify it some somewhere privately where, well, I've never seen him do it and he denies it. And that's good enough for me or whether they just don't think about it. It's just, Hey, nothing, nothing stuck. He, he, he was accused of things years ago and, and, and Ring of Honor uh, let him keep working and nobody seemed to care. And now we've brought him in and, you know, we're, we're not worried about it. Like whatever, it's, it's people in positions of power looking out for their friends. That's not an excuse, but that is what is happening and will continue to happen. And you're going to see Ric Flair on somebody's television eventually. You're probably going to see Marty Skrull on somebody's television eventually, specifically AEW's in the Marty Skrull case, if I had to guess. Like, this is, like, and it's it sucks, and if you choose to wash your hands of a promotion because of that, I got no, I got no argument in, its, in the promotion's favor because they're choosing to get into bed with people that have those allegations against them. There's currently ongoing litigation specifically. Uh, Kelly Klein has sued Sinclair and Ring of Honor. Jay Lethal specifically, I don't know if he's a named like plaintiff in the case, but his harassment of Kelly Klein and other women in Ring of Honor, specifically related to ROH making him the agent for women's matches after Kelly Klein had personally complained about his his alleged harassment uh, is an element of her lawsuit that she brought against Ring of Honor and Sinclair. Um, So even if you want to ask the fluffiest, easiest version of a of a why did you bring Jay Jay Lethal in despite his allegations question, if you just want to ask, was there any concern over bringing Jay Lethal in? while there is pending litigation that names him as a, you know, per- perpetrator of multiple instances of sexual harassment. And like, you can ask it the fluffiest way. And again, that wouldn't necessarily be good journalism if you do ask it the fluff way, <laughs> but it would at least be addressing it. And as the you- lowest bar would have been surpassed. Correct. <laughs> And when we didn't even reach that in the same way that when, you know, perhaps a, an athlete that has been accused of domestic violence or something or has been arrested for for something is brought back on a new team. Usually there is a fluff question asked by local media about was there any concern with bringing him in given recent events or whatever? Like there's a version of that question asked all the time of quote unquote controversial athletes but we don't even get that in wrestling. And if there's a big enough stink made, will he, you know, we'll just bring him back in a mask, you know, like that's, and that's, that's not just a WWE problem. That's not just an AEW problem. That is a industry wide, that is an entertainment industry wide problem. And I, I, as much as like things like the speaking out movement or the me too movement, as much as you'd like to think that that was good and that one or, and maybe one or two high profile people were taken out of their positions of power because of it for every one person that goes down, you know, there's 10 cockroaches that just waited for the light to dissipate. And then they crawled back out and that's, it's going to keep happening. And this is not a happy topic, but I don't, I think, between the two of us here, I don't, I don't know what else to say beyond that. Like, you know, and I know Jay White has publicly professed his innocence. Or Jay White, I see now I'm doing it. Jay Lethal <laughs> has publicly. Jay White hasn't done anything to my knowledge. Jay Lethal has uh, has publicly professed his innocence. And again, if you ask that question, and Tony Khan says 
he has professed, professed his innocence. He is, he is, you know, has been found no wrongdoing by the ROH Sinclair broadcasting team. And that's good enough for me. Again, that's not a good answer to the question, but at least you're addressing it. That would be, again, as you said, the lowest possible bar for this. So the fact that we didn't get that and we just, as a surprise, and he comes out on the pay-per-view and then he wrestles in the main event of Dynamite, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. And then if you look at it on the business side of things, Jay Lethal is like 36 years old. And he's a very good professional wrestler. Like, I think there's kind of a desire that when someone turns out to maybe not be a, a, a very good person, we also want to say that they weren't good at whatever their job was because we still like to have this idea that like there's merit and like people, <laughs> people in positions of success or power like earned it somehow. So if someone is bad, a bad person, that must also mean they're bad at acting or wrestling or whatever. Um, I think Jay Lethal is a very good professional wrestler. Um, I have enjoyed many of his matches, seen him wrestle live multiple times. That being said, like it's, it's going to be an elephant in the room. And, and yes, if you thought if you, and I guess that's the end, the end goal here is that I just want you to know that if you wanted AEW to be the, you know, wholesome, uh, you know, virginal alternative to the CD corporate structure of wwe that takes blood money and and whatever else it's not that it's pro wrestling for all of the good and all of the bad that comes with that and you should be aware of that and you should decide yourself if you want to watch that product if you want to spend money on that product in light of that well so here we have survivor series <laughs> coming up this weekend they decided to do a bunch of brand versus brand matches. The most, the thing with the most heat on this show by far is Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair in a uh, title versus title, a title versus title with no title on the line match. Becky did a, I would say, mostly shoot a little bit kind of a work interview this week with uh, that geek Ariel Helwani talking about. <laughs> Also not a journalist, by the way, Ariel Hawani. Agreed. Uh, doing an interview talking about Ric Flair and Charlotte Flair. And I guess like all good works in wrestling or shoots in wrestling, this one is blurring the lines a little bit. And I guess, you know, Becky said that Rick was sad and Rick or she found Rick's comment sad and that Rick was trying to use her to get clout. And it's like, this is one of the all time legends. And now he's jealous of me and he's trying to use me to promote whatever he has going on next. And mm -hmm. Rick is talking about how he sold WWE, the trademark for the man and how it made Becky Lynch millions of dollars. And he didn't get anything out of it, which he sold it to them. I'm sure you got something out of it, but regardless. <laughs> and like, I think like all good works and shoots, this Becky Charlotte thing is blurring the lines very well, but I tend to think there's more shoot than work to this. Anyway, I think they should be pushing this even harder than they are. I think this is the most interesting thing that's happened in WWE in decades. And I'm very excited to see Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair wrestle at Survivor Series um, what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Yeah, I think I think there's definitely some of that, especially in that uh, that Becky interview this week. There's a part where uh, Helwani asks her specifically about fans chanting for Becky during one of Charlotte's matches when the the pandemic first uh, uh, alleviated yes. a little bit. I think that was whatever that first pay per view they were on, and Charlotte like flipped off the crowd and tried to and then said it was because it was so disrespectful to Rhea and and Becky just very nonchalantly goes she doesn't care about Rhea she didn't <laughs> like it because it was it was upstaging her that's why she didn't like it and I yeah. thought I was like that felt pretty real to me like that felt <laughs> that felt like Char uh, like Becky did not believe that Charlotte cared about Rhea or <laughs> Bianca Belair or any of the other women that were quote unquote being disrespected by fans chanting for Becky Lynch um yeah, I, I 
I wish we did see more of this on television. I'd love to see less, you know, like Charlotte did a promo about Becky, but it was just like about her nicknames and stuff. And it just felt very <laughs> rehearsed on, on the actual SmackDown show on TV. I like, I would like, <laughs> but do you guys, do you remember like what the Brett and Sean promos were like? Mine is like the, the latent homophobia and, and, and stuff like Sean just like went on TV and said that Bret Hart was having an affair. Like, like Brett was really said some really derogatory things about Sean, like, and like the nine cheerleaders who beat him up in the, uh, in Poughkeepsie <laughs> or whatever. And like after, you know, Sean got the crappy album by like a couple of like Marines or whatever, but Brett referred to it as that beating those nine cheerleaders gave you is going to be nothing <laughs> compared to what I'm going to do to you or something like that. Like they were really, really mean to each other. And I would just like to see them, be able to just be mean to each other on television for my enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, Char- Charlotte did insinuate in uh, her promo that Becky had uh, breast implants, which I thought was very right. funny mm-hmm. <laughs> for, for, for several reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, uh, that's an interesting allegation for someone. Uh, in Charlotte's position to uh, to throw out. And kind of make this clear, like obviously I'm on hashtag Team Becky here, but <laughs> I just want I, I just I want good it. television. I I like I like Charlotte. Yeah, I I, I root for her as a person. Like, I, I I I hope she does well in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I think we've talked about this a few times before, but. There was something very real when I think it was in one of the WWE produced documentaries about her, where she spoke very openly about how this was never her dream and it was her little brother's dream. And then her little brother died and she's living out his dream because he can't like that felt very real and really resonated with me. And I really like felt respect and like a genuine, like, yeah, like I think I, after I heard her speak about that so honestly, I, think i appreciated her a little bit more and she's had a lot of good wrestling matches like she's had a lot of very good wrestling matches and moments and like she's talented like i think again i think people maybe don't like her on-screen persona or don't like her and it's subjective to an extent but like she's had a lot of very good wrestling matches she's had she's a pretty effective character on the television show as far as getting a response when she comes out so like yeah, I have no real strong beef with with Charlotte. I, I I just think, yeah, I think if you're looking for the the quote unquote good guy, I mean that was what all the reports said at the time when they when they had their their little tiff on television, right? Was that most people in in the locker room and even in management were were more frustrated with Charlotte and didn't didn't really see that Becky had done anything wrong. So I think that's if that's the case, and the people that know her. And know all of you know know exactly what's going on directly. Then it's probably a fair guess that if that's the vibe you're getting from the television and the interviews as well, that that's yeah, that's probably maybe close to the truth, or at least closer to the truth than than maybe Charlotte would like. And in that interview with Helwani, Becky went on this uh, tangent about how it was a very Bret Hart speech about how when you go out there with someone in wrestling, you're trusting each other with their lives. And if you can't trust the person and we don't do what we agreed on doing, what are we even doing here? Like, yeah, it was very eloquent and it was a very Bret Hart speech and like well worth going out of your way to see. I thought, Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I think that's, that's a great point. Although this does make me worry that we talk, we've been talking so much about Brett and Sean, uh, what are the chances that they do some kind of weird like Montreal rehash? I don't even know I why mean, or who like what the storyline reason for doing it would be. Like, but just for some reason, Vince comes out and rings the bell when Becky's in the figure four or something. It's Survivor Series. <laughs> it's 24 years ago since the original. Mm-hmm. They can't help themselves. They do it all the time. They did it in a match with Brett later in his career, mm-hmm. where like Charlotte and Natty were wrestling, and yep. Brett and Rick were there, and they did the they did the thing with Brett because they can't help themselves. Did so. you ever see Brett talk about that? 
Uh, vaguely to remember something, but not exactly. No. Basically, as as he told the story that when it was explained to him what was going to happen is they were going to do the screw job, and then Brett and Natty were just going to stand in the ring looking dumbfounded, and that was going to be the <laughs> end of the segment. And Brett, who had like just come off some kind of surgery related to, I think his his, his, his prostate, wrist. yeah, or his, his wrist. Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was related to like the cancer or anything but at, anyway he had just come off a of surgery and he was like uh maybe it should end with me and daddy putting them in sharpshooters to get our revenge instead <laughs> and so they did that instead and <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah yeah that did make more sense didn't it <laughs> yeah um yeah. but yeah anyway <laughs> back, back to 2021 or uh yeah i i am definitely more excited for this than anything else wwe has done which is weird because if you just asked me like a month or two ago like oh they're gonna do de- they're gonna do roman reigns and Big E, I was like all right that sounds that sounds good that could be good but they i guess they've kind of half-assed tried the last couple of weeks because roman is beating up biggie's little buddies on on smackdown every week but it just doesn't doesn't feel like that has any juice behind it 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 doesn't feel like it's part of the same universe even just because <laughs> Like, have they mentioned Big E more than one time on SmackDown? That is the <laughs> like, weird part. Like, he's in a feud with Xavier Woods because Xavier Woods is the king, but uh, Roman Reigns doesn't want the Usos to bow to him or something. And so... Bend the knee. Right, bend the knee. And uh, We can't say bow for some reason. Of course not. <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, and so, But yeah, like, you would think, again, it's another thing on paper, you're like, okay, leading up to him wrestling Big E, he's going to beat up Big E's friends. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but we're not really going to address that he's doing it or that he picked a fight with them because they're Big E's friends and he's about to wrestle Big E. So yeah, it is weird that to have him do like back-to-back injury angles with, with Xavier and, and Kofi and then only sort of tangentially mentioned that he's wrestling their best friend on the pay-per-view. Yes, utterly bizarre. A lot of uh, champion versus champion matches. The uh, the five on five team Raw versus team SmackDown matches. They put Tony Storm on the women's. The whole build for this pay-per-view, I would argue, one of the worst pay-per-view builds that <laughs> WWE has ever done. And think of the ground that that covers, including the Survivor Series where Sean, Triple H, and Cena wrestled in a triple threat that was all built around comedy and hornswoggle. <laughs> uh, I, w- I would argue that this overall, this pay-per-view build has been less effective even than that because they the entire build for this has been, uh, they put people on, they announced the, the, the Survivor Series teams uh, on social media on a Saturday afternoon, and then all they've done since then is take people off and put people on the team. And that's been like the whole build. And so <laughs> I have no idea why I'm supposed to care about any of these matches, any of them besides Charlotte and Becky and that stuff. They haven't even done the most interesting build for that on TV. It's just one of the worst pay-per-view builds <laughs> low key that they've ever done. Are they doing us versus intercontinental? Yeah, it's uh, Nakamura against Priest. Yeah. Okay. I mean that. I mean, it's Nakamura in WWE, so I don't expect a lot from it. But you know that could be <laughs> could be all right. I guess. I Who's guess older? The Usos... Nakamura older than Priest? I think Nakamura is like forty two, and okay. Priest is thirty nine, or okay. it's forty and thirty eight, or it's something like that. Okay. So I, think, he's, I think Nakamura is north of 40 now. He's a little bit older than fresh faced rookie uh, Damian Priest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something I noticed about Damian Priest, uh, since we're uh, just totally riffing here now, mm-hmm. <laughs> I saw him when, when I went to a WWE house show in September. Uh, something that I noticed about Priest, he has a little bit of loose skin around his belly from where he used to be a thick boy. And you know, if I've noticed that, you know, Vince McMahon has noticed that. And it's just uh-huh. like, it's really a miracle that this guy isn't, hasn't been put in a singlet. Mm, good point. Well, maybe he could <laughs> borrow uh, the Bearcat singlet now that Keith Lee's gone. Yeah, now that they've released half the half the roster. Yeah. By the way, looking at tickets for the, um, the holiday tour, I think Nick Khan has decided that the first 83 rows are our ringside and should be six hundred dollars <laughs> like 
I've I've grown accustomed to a certain uh, <laughs> not not nosebleed type of experience when I go to a WWE event now. Mm-hmm, I can't mm-hmm. sit in nosebleeds anymore. But also, I'm not going to pay uh, $600 to go to a house show. Like, that's just, that's, that's pretty, criminal. Pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So Survivor Series is coming up. Uh, very low stakes slash no stakes pay-per-view. But uh, <laughs> with one of the worst builds they've ever done. Well, fingers crossed somebody, you know, Becky shoots on Charlotte or Charlotte shoots on Becky. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> We'll see some live can, rounds uh, exchanged, you know, <laughs> very physical match, as Michael Cole likes to say. They had they had a physical one at uh, what was it, Evolution? Is that and the, that's when they were friends. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They had a <laughs> they beat the tar out of each other in that match from memory. Yeah. You know, something that I've wanted to talk about on the show for a year and a half is that Shayna and Becky had a very physical match at WrestleMania. And Becky was pregnant at the time. <laughs> Whoops! Only no one, only it wasn't announced. Like, or maybe she didn't know. But <laughs> that was extremely awkward in hindsight. Yeah, that's not the uh, that's not the best idea. Yeah. Uh, New Japan, uh, they're doing tournaments now. They got their tag team tournament, and they have their uh, the junior heavyweight tournament. Yeah, and Will Osprey's going to wrestle uh, the winner of Shingo and Okada on the second of the uh, three nights of Wrestle Kingdom. And then who does the winner of that wrestle on the third night? I guess we'll find out. I don't know. We think Abushi's going to be back by then? Yes. Okay. Or I guess it could be Naito, that... right? Naito might be back then, too. Naito's already back. Okay. Naito's working oh. the, working the Shows you how much I think they decided Naito's going to be a tag team guy now, though. Okay. He's teaming with, teaming with Sonata in the tag league. Really, it's the best thing for everyone. Agreed. <laughs> I mean, except, I mean, he, he has an ego, though, so I'm sure he's not happy about it. I but... know, um, I know Shingo has said he wanted to wrestle Naito at the dome. I think that was why that was in my head, but just because you want to, you know, necessarily doesn't mean it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's not, well, Unless um, Shingo loses to Okada on night one, they could do Shingo and Naito on night two. Oh. And Okada and Osprey will be the title match on night two. And then uh, Okada and Ibushi could be the match on night three when they're at, uh, I think it's Yokohama Arena. Mm. I I think that's how it's going to go. Is Okada's going to win the title on the first from Shingo on the first night. Okada is going to beat Osprey on the second night, and then Ibushi and Okada will wrestle on the third night. I mean, that's, I mean, it'll be good. Right? Like, it's a lot, but it'll be good. The yeah, those are good matches. Be. Those are good matches. Yeah. It's just they don't understand the basic laws of supply and demand. <laughs> I guess the only other note there with Okada is he's getting name dropped just left and right on, uh, on AEW television right now. Yeah, and he's in the United States right now. So you would think maybe sometime over the next three weeks or so, we're going to get Okada on Dynamite doing a tag match or, or something of that nature. Yeah, I guess it would be interesting to see like what they do with him because there's is there still the two-week quarantine for getting back into Japan right now? Uh, yes. Okay, so like... If this, if we only have him for like a month while World Tag League is going on, and then he's he's got to go back, whatever two weeks before Tokyo Dome, I I just have to wonder. It's like, well, can you shoot something that short term to get to like a big singles match with him and somebody from AEW? Like, I would I, think I think you'd want to do him and Danielson on a pay per view, right? Like, you don't want to just do that on like a December Dynamite. I don't think it. I think if you got a chance to do a big singles match with him, you do it. I don't think they have the time to do that. Like December 21st through 24th is the road to Tokyo Dome tour in, mm-hmm. in Japan where they do like the big angles before the for the Rust King matches. So he's got to be back in Japan by December 7th. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at we have uh, 11, 18 days. <laughs> okay. So I think to me, like a one-off 
tag thing like they did with Ishii on Dynamite this week is far more likely. And then maybe when travel restrictions ease next year, you can start sending people over there or bringing him back over here where he doesn't have to quarantine for two weeks and you can build something more long term. But yeah, obviously, I think they want to do. I think it'll be a tag thing first sometime here in the next few weeks. And then we'll finally uh, get our, 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 yeah. our greatest wish to see Kazuchika Okada wrestle Jack Evans. <laughs> sure. Matt Hardy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two legends equally important to their generations. Matt Hardy and Kazuchika Okada. Sounds good. All right. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, we got a, we covered a lot of ground. We both filibustered on on the state of professional wrestling uh, for about five minutes each. And uh, the spoiler alert, we still got another show to record. So let's get out of here for this week. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Till next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back next week with the Thanksgiving Spectacular and more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. No idea what number this is. I wrote it in the message, I think. Oh. uh. (laughs) See, I took Ambien... Uh, <laughs> at like four o'clock this morning, mm-hmm. and uh, then I had to wake up at 11 something to do work, and then I had fell back asleep. Anyway, I'm just starting to feel normal now. It's the noted uh, 283. All right, I try to keep on keeping on.